She knows how to do it. <laughs> we would like to welcome you, ladies and gentlemen, to our first Founders Forum in 2011. We are a new society. Um, the Founders Forums before have been under the Virgin Valley Historical Committee, and we have formed a, a new society called the Virgin Valley Historical Society. And so we're excited to uh, present these programs to you. And we thank you for coming tonight. We're excited about our, <coughs> excuse me, about our guest speaker, uh, Geraldine Sadate. She and I went to school together, so we go back a long way. <laughs> and uh, she is very interested in the history of Mesquite. And we're, ex we're really lucky to have her tonight and, and have her discuss with us what she has found as she has um, written the book and, and just been gathering all of the historical information throughout her life. Um, also tonight, Merlin Hafen, who is also um, a member of the Historical Society, but he's also a longtime member of Mesquite, <laughs> a citizen of Mesquite. His family has roots here also, so we're happy to have him as our monitor today. So um, we would like to um, just make one announcement. Um, the Virgin Valley High School art class has a display up at the high school in the uh, lobby area by the auditorium, and they have taken historical pictures of the Virgin Valley area and have made paintings of them, and they're wonderful. I, I don't know how many of you were at the, the production of the BYU dancers. You might have noticed them then because they were up at that time, but they are wonderful. So if you get a chance to go back or would like to go see that, please do. Uh, you will enjoy those. Um, we will now turn the time over to Merlin Haven and Geraldine Sadate. Thank you. Thank you, Gwen. One more announcement that we forgot it, uh, to mention Margaret Hardy, and it's her 100th birthday this week. So most of what's in the book has been covered. Uh, Margaret's actually lived uh, that, so just want to mention that. Um, also, just uh, how our Gerald, Geraldine and I tie in, um, many years ago, back when there weren't a whole lot of things to do on Mesquite, in Mesquite for the New Year's Eve, my family and I ended up at the uh, Western Village for our New Year's Eve dinner. Geraldine was the waitress, and of course there wasn't a whole lot going on, so she was able to sit down and visit, so that goes way back. Um, so, first of all, Geraldine, would you tell us about your family and how many generations? You're the fourth generation, I believe. Right, <clears throat> right. I have two sets of great grandparents that were early settlers in the valley. The Johnsons, Nephi and Margaret Johnson, came into the valley in uh, 97, 1897, and the Pulsifers, John, David, and uh, Anne Elizabeth, came in in the in the 1900s. And then, just subsequently, everyone has stayed here. My grandparents and my parents and uh, myself, lifetime. And I have grandchildren now that are going to be the sixth generation that live here. Uh, they came from different areas of southern Utah and uh, came as adults that my great-grandparents came uh, to find farming land. My grandparents that were the Pultzfers that came from Hebron were looking for uh, better weather. My grandfather had worked in the Delmont Mine up in, uh, which is a ghost town now, in Nevada, and had gotten that terrible lung disease that uh, was involved in that kind of mining. And he uh, just was not able to work anymore. And when he came down, he had four strong sons, and they basically did the work on the farm. He was not able to very much. So that's why my roots are really deep. They love the valley, and every subsequent generation has, and it's just absolutely passed on to me. So that's that's my history. <laughs> okay, and your mother passed away just in the last few yes, months. Yes, my mother in ninety uh, passed away at 91 this last June. 
She was born in a tent down where the Casablanca golf course is now. That was the family's, what we call the lower ranch. And uh, her family lived down there while they farmed before they built a home up uh, further, which would be where the uh, Casablanca parking lot is now, right at the end of Smoky Lane. And so um, my mom helped me uh, understand the valley. I mean, she knew everybody. We were related to a lot of people. And when I, I got to writing this book, which I will tell you about, um, because her memory was just sharp, sharp, and her eyesight was excellent, too. She did use a magnifying glass to look at some of the old photos that helped me identify, and she remembered it all. So. Now, your father wasn't from here, though. No, my so. father was from southern Utah, and he came down as a young man to work at uh, a, a garage, a service station here, and met Mom when she was 18 years old, sweet little high school girl. And uh, he, he, But he, let, he was so tired of snow that he, he stayed and loved her. So he, they, they stayed here all their lives, except for the few years during the war when uh, Dad went to work in Boulder City for the uh, government at the Bureau of Mines. And that was where I was born was in Boulder City. So, but then they came right back, and so I still consider myself a native. <laughs> and, and your childhood, you lived on the boulevard, right? Right. Um, my folks built a house uh, the year I was born, 47, and they lived in the basement of it for a while. It was just dug out, uh, concrete basement, and they lived in that while they built the upper part over it. And then uh, it was in a part of an old grape farm, and uh, it was right on the boulevard, and so I, well, the main street, whatever. It was uh, just a, some of the, how, where we all lived. I think we about all lived on where the traffic was. The fields were all beyond. So I've always felt like I've lived in the center of town, which forced me to have to walk everywhere. I had to walk so far to school. And uh, so we were just always close to everything. So. I believe that street was called Plum Street at one time. It went plumb through town. <laughs> plumb through town. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, did, did you have to walk to school? I did. Was oh. it in Bunkerville? Or? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, not that far. No, I, uh, and you know, it wasn't that bad. It was, um, I don't know, I never measured it. I've always told my kids it was miles and miles, but it wasn't that far. But everybody walked to school, so, Yeah. And that was the old school up here by the... Yeah, the elementary and when the elementary and high school were together. Yep. Where the old gym is now. Yep. Pardon. And friends, were they all from around here? Or yep, where? Gwen. Gwen was just six months younger than I. And we uh, and her twin brother. And I mean, yeah, our high school graduating class had 22 kids in it. So now I have no idea. I, I know my kids' graduating classes were really large, but I know it's... It's a lot bigger than that, but um, yeah, we had 11 boys and 11 girls in our graduating class, so it was small, still small. Well, just a few years after you graduated when I did, we only had 34, oh, and that was with two graduating juniors, but anyway. And was the church at the school at that time also? Yes, we went to school in, I mean, went to church in the auditorium, uh, was our, uh, the ch sacrament meetings, and uh, then we had uh, our junior Sunday school, which was called then, in the gym. And we went to Sunday school class in our kindergarten class. So we went to school and church in the same place. Yep. And that's it. one thing I discovered in some of my mom's photos was it showed us giving our school program on the, high sc on, on the school, on the elementary school auditorium. And uh, it just seems so strange now to see us doing church things in school buildings, especially, you know, the whole program was very, but it, it was the, it was actually, it was the elementary school program, and it was all about the story of Jesus. So anyway, wouldn't happen now. <laughs> so, so you went to the school six days a week and probably Saturdays, all the activities? Oh, and then there were funerals on Saturdays, yes, and then primary after school, yep, same building. So after school, uh, or when you graduated, you came back to be a librarian, or you stayed in no, your school? No, I went on to school, uh, to college, and graduated from Dixie Junior College, which then, and then on to Cedar City. I, I did not major in any, li I took no library science classes, and was really interested in art, the history of art, researching. I spent a, a couple of summers in Europe doing research, and... Um, 
traveling, having a great time. And when I came back, was married, and went into an interview for this opening at the library, Maureen Hughes, who was the librarian now, who had been a librarian at the old hospital, they had moved it. It was when Clark County Library District was formed, and they became a separate entity than anything else, so they didn't have to rely on monies for the county. They became the Clark County Library District, and they moved her up to the high school, and she shared the high school librarian with the county library. They had two sets of book stamps, two rulers, two, uh, two bottles of pencils. Everything had to be separate. They shared a desk. The collections were shelved on the set, and that did not work out. That was so confusing. So the county decided, well, we'll put her in a little trailer. So Maureen came down, and they put her in a little trailer down on the street that's now Yucca. And uh, that wasn't really too exciting either, but they promised that the county was going to build a building on this block. And there was a, a corner block. Some of you remember the old community center. And in that community center was one room, and they put a library in there. Well, she moved in from the trailer and thought she had died and gone to heaven. And it, it was a nice room, it, but it was just one room. And she decided soon after that to retire. And um, well, I remember the day I saw the notice for the opening of a librarian, and I thought, they pay people to work in libraries? Because libraries, I had grown up here with a little library at school, which they kept open all year round. So during the summer, I would ride my bike. This is when I didn't have to walk. Rode my bike up to get books and read my way from one end of that library to the other. And so I loved libraries, loved books. They were my best friends. And when that job opening came up and I went for the interview, and they said, well, what library science classes have you taken? And I could, I, Honestly, I, I've not taken any library science, but I know libraries from top to bottom. In college, my research, my, all my papers uh, were, were all done through a lot extensive research, research in libraries. So I just kind of thought that should qualify me. Well, fortunately, it did. I think maybe I didn't have a lot of competition. I don't know for sure, but I got the job. And the library was one little room, open 20 hours a week, and... There were days when I never had one person come in. So, my, I thought I had died and gone to heaven. I, I, I worked in a room full of just friends. I started working my way from one end of the library to the other reading books, and I got away from my children. My mother was so sweet about it. She lived right next door to me, and she did a wonderful job of raising those children while I worked those 20 hours a week. In 1990... The county just seemed to be rolling in dull. The library district was doing so well. It seemed like every year a new casino came, in, uh, came into effect in Las Vegas, and that was the revenue base for the library district. It was all property tax. And so they were building libraries all over the place, and Mesquite uh, at that time had been incorporated. The city had taken over the community center. They needed that library space for their city offices. The mayor needed an office. All of the workers and the clerks needed offices. So they um, said they worked a deal. There was the old property out behind the church, which had been a welfare farm, which I had grown up helping pick broom corn on. And, and, the, church, and the church sold it to the city for a library. And so we... We had a wonderful library, but I'll tell you, the day we opened up, Jimmy Hughes was the mayor, and we were kind of looking around, and I thought, oh, my goodness, we've moved in the library, and it's already too small, and unfortunately, we're still in it. It is a tiny library. I can see all of you shaking your head, and, and the day I moved in, Gwen was there. She was my first assistant. I mean, I had never, if the library, be, if the library was open, I was there pretty much before that time. I had never had an assistant. And so the library was then, I think, open 40 hours a week, something like that. I mean, we were open hours. It was wonderful. But um, the, those days are gone, I guess. It looks like you know we may have this library for a long time. 
fortunately, with the internet and uh, availability of ordering books online, we can now request we don't have to have the huge collections that we had then. But when Gwen and I started there, oh my word, we had to learn computers, we had to learn, it was no longer the stamping. I thought I was gonna go you know, forever stamping books and inserting cards into the pockets in books. And, uh, you know, then it just there immediately. It was on the job learning of, of and I was, I was pulled kicking and screaming into the 20th century. I, I thought that books and I mean, cards and pockets were just fine. In fact, we used to, uh, when I would go substitute in Bunkerville at the library over there, they used to file according to family name, not the day you checked it out, not the book you checked out. They did it, to, the fa each family had a slot in the, and I, that was confusing, but anyway, um, it was a tiny library to start with, and uh, it, it has grown. So I, I remember the, day, the month that we had 125 items checked out of the library. That was record-breaking, unbelievable, and that was, uh, and, and we did story time. I would do, st I would go in and do story time in the library, and I was there all alone with with a, with a bunch of kids. And somebody would need to check a book out at the library, so I'd pick up a kid and run over and ch check a book out, and then go back to story time. So it was really, really a challenge. But um, I don't. Does that answer any question that you even remotely asked, Merlin? I don't. It, it does. In fact, I was going to ask how it changed from oh, yeah. from here to there, and then all your computer work yeah. that you you had over there too. Yeah. What year did you move into that? The in ninety, Leopard. we we started here that the the, um, the old community center, which I'm sure you remember, was it was a senior center too. Plus, uh, we paid utility bills there too. Yeah, we paid power and. I can't remember what, what I don't what other it didn't seem like we had a lot of utility bills in those days. And that was built in seventy-three. And then seventy-five they, they moved into this uh, I mean the library that, that building was built in seventy-five. And then they moved into that and the building over there was ninety. So it's twenty years old last year. That that building is twenty years old. And it was when we moved in, it was already too small. And that was just, Mesquite was just on the, the brink of just exploding. And uh, it had already started, but it was. So I sympathize because I'm still a, bo a book reader and I still love the library, but it, it's a trial <laughs> to go in there, even with the wonderful new self-checkout and uh, the wonderful people that work there. When I... When I started, I was the only person 20 hours a week. And when I retired, there, there was a staff of 11. And my job had turned into manager. You know, I, I no longer, they didn't even uh, have us selecting our own. It used to be I could select books for the library because I understood what everybody wanted here. And now it's if one library gets it, they all get it. So that includes you know, the good stuff and the bad stuff. Everybody has the same collections, which I think cuts out the uniqueness of each town. We were part of the rural systems, and so every little Good Springs, you know, Indian Springs, Searchlight, we all had very individual uh, uh, patron base that we understood as librarians, and they didn't seem to understand. They just figured that equality was equality and everybody should have the same collection no matter what. So uh, so my job did. It changed from being a librarian and book selector to manager, which really took a lot of the fun out of it. <laughs> so you weren't able to read on the job as much either? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that went, by the way, a long time. After, yeah, got, it got busy. Mesquite was just really on... on the growth. It was amazing to sit back and watch that growth. And I'd see it, right? I felt like I was on the front lines there, too. Because we never decreased in circulation. And from, from October of 1977, every single month till I retired 27 years later, circulation just grew. Just some months doubled. It was just incredible, the growth. I mean, that, that was a real indicator of the growth. And often, I was surprised to how many people came into Mesquite shopping for a place to live. I mean, shopping for a town to live. And the things that they judged it on, and uh, the quality of the library came up real high on their list. They would come and say, yes, they would come and say, 
uh, show me your library and what services do you have? And so uh, I think it's a really important thing, really important. Well, I'm off the soapbox now. Okay, Merlin. <laughs> well, how was your transi transition from librarian to author? Tell us a little oh. bit about that. <laughs> well, when I retired, I figured, well, I just need to reinvent myself. But what I really did was I had a chance to sit back and you know, nearly wear out my passport. <laughs> I got a passport the week I retired and got a lot of that traveling bug kind of out. Uh, went to Australia and England and Canada and d did a lot of traveling that I wanted to do. But um, there were things that I had wanted to do. All that I, I was been awfully busy raising a family and with a career and, and that I hadn't really thought I would have. I had decided that uh, what I had wanted to do was go back to my um, major in college, which was history. I mean, hist art history. And in the research uh, and the effort to get a degree, I had to take practical art classes, oils, painting, sketching, uh, watercolors, all of that out in the you know, plain air, uh, doing like that. I didn't think I was any good. I thought I was pretty, pretty bad, in fact. And so my interest did revolve around art history. I spent a lot of time in museums all over the world. Well, I uh, met the wonderful group that is over here at the gallery, the Virgin Valley Artists Association, and totally just loved all of them, took in a few of the things that I had tried and got a really great response. People really liked them the paintings that I had painted, and so I got onto that, and uh, I entered a show, entered three pieces in the first show, first three paintings I had ever painted, <laughs> took first place and sold all three of them. So I immediately thought, well, that's what I want to do. But I kept in touch with the librarian and, and, and met the new librarian who had taken over my place, and we became friends. And Two years ago, nearly two years ago, I got a phone call who said, the librarian in your town has told us to call you and talk to you about writing a book for us. And, oh, man, that scared me to death because I had no idea what, uh, what writing a book was about, entailed. It seemed just really intimidating to me. But I said, what about? And they said, we have a series of books about small towns America. And we hear Mesquite is an is a interesting little town, has a story to tell, has an interesting history, and we want you to tell it. I said, oh, I don't think so. I said, oh, that's been done. And they said, no, not in the format that we do it. We print books with vintage original source photos, and uh, they're very unique. And so I basically said, oh, I don't think so, I don't think so. So several calls later, I said, okay, give me the name of your company. So while I had her on the phone, I was just Googling like crazy to try to find out if they were even legit. I, you know, being a librarian, I, still, I had never heard of this company. So anyway. Um, I really like the looks of their book. They, they keep them short. They keep them uh, very uniform. I mean, 28 pages, no more, no less. 200, almost no more, no less, original source vintage photo. Well, that panicked me, too, because it, it had been my experience in looking at old photos that uh, of, of the area, that the people had not, you know, they were really poor. They couldn't afford cameras. That, that was the least of their problems, was, was taking a picture of their hard work and uh, photographing, you know, their struggle. Uh, so I've, I told them that. Oh, persistent people that they were. It was Debbie uh, Saracini, who, was, who turned out to be my editor, um, insisted that there must be must be photos. She said, are you looking hard enough? And I said, I will, I will look. She says, okay, we're going to send you a contract. You sign it, send it back. And so before I signed the contract, I wanted to be sure that I could find it. So I find enough photos to satisfy them. I talked to my mom. My mom lived with me. And she, she, her health was not real good, but it hadn't gotten really bad yet. So 
she said, well, honey, you know, because my mom thought I just could do anything. So she probably wasn't the one to talk to. I wanted someone who had a real sense of reality that I, you know, this, this was going to be hard. So I started calling some people I knew in town. Do you have photos that we have not seen before? Do you have photos that original source? And I'm sorry to say that a lot of the times that I went searching for these photos, I found they were photocopies or they were newspaper uh, article photos, or, or something they would, I knew they would not satisfy the, the publisher. Yeah. Now, Geraldine, can I interrupt there? Yes. You told us before that you couldn't Photoshop the pictures, correct? Couldn't Photoshop a thing. And they wanted untouched, you know, I mean, even crinkles and, you know, scrapes and bug bites, because uh, that's another thing. I, I mean, with the heat and the bugs around here, Old photos put away in attics and cellars and that really suffered too. So uh, number one, if they could afford a camera, I found they couldn't hold it still kind of often because I would find some wonderful subjects that if only you could see who it was, <laughs> they would have been wonderful. But, uh, and if they could afford a camera, hold it still, then the bugs or the heat got to them. So I really had my work cut out for me. And when they sent the contract, and I saw that I was committing myself to deadlines, which I'm not a real good deadline person. I don't like being, you know, really pushed too hard. Uh, but the editor was so sweet. Nice lady. Never met her. We've only dealt over the phone and over the Internet. She said, I'll hold your hand all the way through it. So I thought, well, okay. So, but boy, as soon as that contract got signed, that holding hand business, it was foot in the back. You know, it was, you've got a deadline, you know, you need to get it in. So I spent, oh, and it was the summer, it was two years ago this summer, that I spent in people's hot back rooms, an air conditioned, in their attics, looking through things that they kept, you know, they were back here saying, oh, yeah, there's something there. Just know, I know I've seen it. And I would find, you know, and I'd have to smile when I found what they, what they thought they had. So they weren't always real good. But bless their hearts at the museum. They, have come, they came through with some wonderful archives. So with the things that, that I had been able to find and with the archives at the Virgin Valley Heritage Museum, I had hope. I had hope that I could come with the 200. I came up and I think cried on Aaron's shoulder up here at City Hall. And he said, oh, you can do it. You know, it'll be wonderful. And, and I kept in the back of my mind thinking, this will be a wonderful project for my secret dream, which was for us to go independent and become a society. And this could be the, the beginnings of, a, of fundraisers and a fund for us to do the, the projects that we have in, in mind that we want to do. So uh, I started assembling the, the bones of the, you know, they have a very definite word count. And I finally learned how to count the words on. I was counting on the screen. Nobody told me about tools in Microsoft. <laughs> well, I learned that fast. Uh, and they're really limited in space. Limited in, oh, yes, they're laughing like I didn't know. Yes. So, and we had to talk about you know, double sheets, and I, I learned a lot, learned a lot from, from the company and from the editor of, of how, to, how to do it. Do you have a favorite story or a favorite picture that's in there? Favorite picture, well, I've got a lot of favorite pictures, but there were ones that I would find that I had never seen before, didn't know existed. Um, one of them was... Uh, all the time, my mom tells stories about going into stores, you know, and there'd be one candy bar or two candy bars, uh, buying things in these little tiny stores that uh, would be around town. And I, you know, I'd say, okay, mom, tell me about it. What was it like? And she'd tell me, and I just thought somebody must have taken a photograph inside those stores. I, had, I said, I asked mom, I asked everybody, and they had not uh, known of any. They, they said, no, our family didn't. I mean, why would you take a picture of your store? I, it's funny how when you're doing it, you don't think about taking it inside. Because have we ever seen a picture of J.L. Bowler's store? And yet, that's how we grew up, you know, was shopping there. But we never would have thought of taking a camera in there. Well, one day, I 
found the inside of, of an old store. The problem was, his name was, was Shorty, and he was a very small little man. Someone had taken and uh, something sharp and had scratched through his image. You still could see, but he was kind of wavy, and boy, that was where the Photoshop. I just thought, oh, please, just let me photo. But I knew they wouldn't let me. So I have the only picture that I could find of the inside of a store, and the proprietor is sort of squiggly, but uh, otherwise it's good. You can see the, so the things he's selling on the shelf and the cash-only sign, you know, no credit and, and things like that. So... That was that was exciting. I think I yippied real loud over that. Poor people that were around me when I was doing my research. I think it was scary. And another one was the drinking out of the ditch one because it was something that, you know, you kind of knew that people did. Or my mom, you know, I'm, oh, no, no, we never drank out of the ditch. Well, mom, I think so. I said, didn't you as a kid? Oh, she says, I don't think my mom would. I said, would you ever take a cup down and dip it in the ditch and drink it? But no, when I found the picture of the two young school teachers down on their bellies in the dirt, drinking, with their heads down, drinking out of a ditch. But further investigation made me suspicious that it was a sincere drinking because they're two school teachers. They're dressed very proper. You can see their little dark, dark stockings of their legs up in the air. And uh, they, they, they have, I believe, they have written on the photo, in quotation marks, school drinking fountain. And, uh, okay, school teacher, except the house in the background isn't anywhere near the school. It's clear down, you know, the school was up here on, on the upper block. And the house was down here by where the telephone company. And... It just didn't ring true. So I, I think it was two, the two, sis, two young sisters kind of, I don't know, pretending or just copying what they saw their kids do all the time. So um, there, there are others uh, with putting really, and, and they insisted on really the publisher high, high resolution of the photos. So they had to be scanned really, really high. So that enabled me to put them on my computer. And boy, I could just bring those close and I could see people clear back in fields. I could see children on playgrounds that I could nearly recognize. That was exciting and kind of discouraging because still, when they're reduced back after it being high resolution and really big and they're reduced back and put in the back, you lose that, except I now have them on disk uh, scanned very highly and you can uh, really make people out. As I was looking at a picture of the schoolroom, schoolhouse, the old wooden schoolhouse that was over here where now Janet uh, Dodenbeer has her, Janet Anderson, Janet Dodenbeer has her, Janet Anderson Dodenbeer, sorry, has her portrait company. That's where the old lumber schoolhouse was. And the photo has been taken from across the street and shows up uh, Willow Street, which is now Willow Street. You can see across the street where there's people, adults, gathered around and that's right where the old relief society building was that's right where the tithing yard was and so um that's there's there's a group of adults there and across the street are children so i have surmised that it was not on a school day it was probably a ward function and the children because the girls are dressed up quite cute complete with little pinafores and really cute things and and they're seeing they seem to be playing games in school ground which was the church also but anyway that was interesting. I spent a lot of time magnifying and bringing up and placing, and, and we had to do that. I, I had to do that so that I could be assured that I knew right where that, that was. The Mesa was a wonderful landmark. You know, you could tell what, you know, which direction, which street it was by using the Mesa, the mountain. Cougar Hill was another good one, the old uh, hill that's uh, down by Walmart or was down by Walmart. And uh, you could place fields and things like that there. So did I answer that question? Oh, yeah. <laughs> also, um, that tells about the pictures. What about stories? Did you come up with some of the stories to go with the pictures yeah. or the pictures to go with the stories? Um, I spent a lot of time reading journals, uh, pioneer journals, and um, really got inside families' heads that, that I had known only from the outside. I had grown up hearing about my family, 
Pulsifers, the Johnsons, the Jansons, the Bowlers. And so you, you heard about uh, things that happened or, or things of other families. And I got to really hear, you know, I got to really learn about. So what it did mostly for me is just to immerse me in the background. Uh, so I understood uh, the, uh, the Hughes store, I, about their, their kind of struggles of keeping merchandise in there and keeping that store running and, and being able to, as any merchandiser or a retailer, of knowing what the people need and want and finding that, ordering it from who knows where, that I couldn't find it, in the region somewhere, and then bringing it in by train to Moapa, going down in a, in a buckboard and horses team and bringing the stuff back special orders like windows and doors for these homes because materials just were not available here. Uh, the men, uh, Bishop Abbott, uh, William E. Abbott, who was building this house, which is the general store now. It's in that big two-story house. How he went himself, hired some young men to gather the rocks for that foundation. And I mean, every step of the way, he had it figured out. He was a, really a smart, smart man and, and ambitious. And uh, so reading his journal and his wife's journal and uh, the subsequent children's journal about growing up in that house and how, how he would, uh, he ordered some really nice fittings from back east and they were brought in by train and then they had to be picked up down at Mwapa. You know, that was no short ride either. And I, I've been wondering about bringing windows. I mean... I assume they had the glass in the windows already. I don't know that. It just struck me. Because I just thought about rumbling up through, you know, bringing in that, that stuff to put in that house that they were building. And it was a two-story house. It was a big project. And immediately started to think about making it into a commercial deal, renting rooms out, having part of it as a little restaurant, feeding travelers. Um, yeah. So that's, yeah, to answer your question, the stories were, were what was fascinating. And finding details were sometimes just heartbreaking. Uh, the, no, oh, the story of, of uh, the young man who was riding on the, the um, running board of, of his father-in-law's, Bishop Abbott's, car, he was just riding along, you know, like we all did, you know, we, before there were laws, we rode on running boards and backs of pickups and stuff, and an orange truck from California sideswipes the car and just injures him so seriously, and, uh, and in, in and, and, I mean, he eventually dies, he, they cannot even get him to St. George fast enough, but in the, kind of a, as an afterthought in one of the journals, and the orange truck didn't even stop. <laughs> so it was just, just the tragedy of the lives of, of no medical help here, and just reading how they just sort of took it in their stride, took it for granted that if you got hurt bad, it just, you know, hands the arms that were mangled and things. A, a, a little girl, oh, the, the tragic story about the Huntsman family that, that the mother uh, was doing the wash, and she had um, a cup of lye and in a little water cup, in a drinking cup, and the little girl drank it. That little girl survived for two years in just absolute horrible condition. The family, it just nearly destroyed the family, and the mother, the mother died within a year. And the older brother... Ralph Huntsman, who became a well-known and very talented painter, nursed that little sister, and I broke his heart. It affected him the rest of his life. But things like that, there was nothing they could do. They couldn't take her anywhere. They didn't take her anywhere. She just suffered having drunk lie. So those journals were heartbreaking. What about flooding? In light of the recent flooding we've had here, I know that there was always it's a same thing recurring again. story. Yeah, yeah. At least we didn't build houses too real close down to the river, but uh, but they did. Uh, the story of uh, Littlefield. People go have the wonderful Christmas Eve celebration up in uh, up with their families in Santa Clara, and they come back so they can have Christmas here at home. And when they come back, there is no home. 
But Beaver Dam was just totally wiped away on Christmas Eve in uh, 1882. It was or eight, like it's 1882. It was before um, Mesquite was permanently settled. But in in Mesquite, um, I, I don't ever, I, I didn't really ever, in Bunkerville, yes, there were homes, but it seemed like Mesquite sat up just high enough that the homes were okay. The problem with the flooding is that the water comes down the canal, and that, that was the problem. The water came down the canal, the water washed out it and ditches and crops, so they were left with nothing. They, you know, no crops, no livelihood, an entire works, uh, year's work gone. So that was the tragedy. That was the devastation. Corrals would be swept out, animals too, but I didn't ever find any record of, you know, real serious home damage. There, there could be water in it, but honestly, some of the homes that they had, you know, I don't know if it was, that, you know, they usually were still standing. Um, materials for homes, I, you know, I don't know if that actually, you know, where in Littlefield they used a lot, they had cottonwoods and they used a lot of wood, but here they, they used a lot of rock because of the availability of rock as opposed to uh, lumber. So flooding, is it ever going to stop? Uh, I don't, you know, the river is too darn hard to, to dam sufficiently. And this was, I could not believe, my son took me Christmas Day down to see the diversion dam, the Bunkerville diversion dam, where it used to be. And I mean, it was just, I mean, all my life that dam has been there. Thought that they had finally had it you know, in, in, in the 40, 50s, I think it was, finally found a way to sink, you know, railroad rails down in to really get a solid base, and apparently not. Apparently not. So, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, flooding forever. <laughs> also, in your research, I know you came over some stories that uh, we've grew and grown up with, uh, controversial that may we're probably you... referring to ah yes <laughs> the the world's fair and the raisins um i don't know <laughs> i called i searched i googled everything i could find to validate the story about the world's san francisco world's fair and the farmers and the and the uh, growers Taking, ma getting prizes for things, and the years they just didn't. So, in my book, I had to qualify it and say I think maybe the year was wrong, but only off by like two years. So, uh, I cannot, I could not validate it. And I called other authors, and they said they had set, tried everything too. So, it was kind of wishful thinking. But they did, they did raise wonderful grapes and and raisins. The downfall is that we're so far away. We were so isolated. How could we compete with San Joaquin Valley and Napa Valley and wherever they grow all the grapes and, and, and no railroad? It might have made all the difference in the world if we had gotten that darn railroad contract and gotten it through, but it ended in Wapa. But anyway, so everything had to be hauled by... Um, buckboard and team down to Moapa and then hauled. And I, you know, I wonder what condition grapes and raisins would be in by the time they got over those roads, on the train, all the way to San Francisco for a fair. But anyway, apparently they did win some prizes. We just are not sure, you know, which, which they were. So that was kind of disappointing. Mm -hmm. I wanted, I wanted to see a picture of the, of the ribbons and the trophies, but no such luck. Well, if anybody has them out there, yes. bring them to Geraldine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the, now, the pomegranates, you could believe, because they'd have a little bit yeah. hardier, but Yeah, grapes. the pomegranates might, might last through a train ride and a buckboard ride. I don't know, but we do have good pomegranates, good old pommies, yep. Any other stories like that that you came across? That uh, not, not, I, I always tried to double, triple check sources. I would I would call people on the phone and sometimes I'd startle them and they would have to really think and so I was always getting you know calls back for people that would um, remember something and it would kind of send me off on another search but I I was so determined that this book was going to be factual 
no wishful thinking, no second guessing, or no expanding of a story to make it any spectacular. When I came upon this family uh, in Littlefield that just kept losing all of these children and tragic, tragic stories, was the Frainers, I, um, I didn't stress that. I called and asked family, and I mean, it's still very tender stories, uh, very sad things in their family history that uh, can be verified with death certificates and uh, journals, diaries, reporting about, you know, the children that, that uh, and, and these diseases that swept through the town. I mean, typhoid and, uh, you know, we, we, we were isolated, but we certainly were not isolated from, from epidemics the flu, epi the, you know, the 1918 flu epidemic that swept through the United States hit here too. Uh, so, yeah, ev everything, everything I really tried to, uh, and, and of course there were many times when I wanted to write more. I thought I really would like to explain this. And it, it sort of forced me to make larger, which I was allowed, larger chapter headings. But even that I was limited to in word count. And so it was sort of a case of reducing the story of Mesquite to almost the smallest common denominator so that to a casual reader, it's more, it's faster. People have, I, I've gotten some wonderful comments. I bought it for a plane ride. It was just perfect, just the right length and got me got me through my trip. And uh, some that, that bought him as as Christmas, or gave them as Christmas gifts, and everybody finished him Christmas Day, and it was just right, and they sat around and talked about family. So that was kind of the goal with the book, uh, was to tell the story of Mesquite. So not too sad, <laughs> not too, um, uh, I don't know, overly dramatic, because Mesquite has a story that doesn't need to be overly dramatized. It was real, and it, it was gritty, but it was wonderful, wonderful family life, special people. So uh, I, that's what I really wanted to come, to come across in the story. I wanted to tell about how just ordinary people heeded a call to come down. They came with a mission. They came determined to make that succeed to accomplish what they knew that they had to do, and that's why they stayed. I, every every, uh, every uh, Mesquite Days, we give tours. The society gives tours through some of the old buildings, and sometimes I get groups of people through there who, who really have a difficult time of understanding why people would stay here. They said, we've, we've lived here through July and August. How in the world? And I say, I don't know, because I whine with the best of them through July and August when I have to run from my air-conditioned car to my air-conditioned house, and I think of my great-grandmothers cooking over fires with their probably wool clothes. I don't know. I would hope they didn't, but, you know, heavy clothing and no relief, no relief. You couldn't, you know, hurry and do it and then run into someplace cool. So... It, it's, it may be hard for us to understand, but I, I hoped when I did this that I could explain. I could explain what, what, what was in their hearts and why they were doing it and the fact that we're real lucky. We're real lucky they did. We're fortunate that we are reaping the, the love. I mean, every time I see a, a sunset and I think, wow, I wonder if they saw, and I, I'm sure they did, I'm sure they saw the same wildflowers in the desert that we see and uh, the same, you know, beauty that we see around us that they did. And so I, I hope that they were paid back in a little way. They, they, they loved the country, too. They stayed. Now where can you, we get a copy of the book oh. for those who don't have one yet? <laughs> well, you can just step right up here. We are using these as fundraiser for our society. The Virgin Valley Historical Society is just taking off right now. We are accepting memberships. We have some projects that in our heart of hearts we want to accomplish in this valley. And it involves with preserving 
the history. We, we want to honor the people who came before us. There's projects like the Rock House, which is over on the corner of Willow and uh, First North. We give tours of that and the Relief Society building on Mesquite Days and hope to continue that for a long time. We'd like to see the gym uh, become useful as a community center for, for everyone. We'd like, we, in, in Littlefield, uh, I would love to see the old school re restored, refurbished, used as a community building uh, in Littlefield. It's a wonderful old school. Uh, one room, kids went to school there a long time. I mean, just in one, in one, uh, one room, one teacher, sometimes two rooms with one teacher. And some wonderful people came out of there. When I was thinking the other day about all the doctors and the awesome people that graduated from that, from that little school. And in Bunkerville, we had a program uh, in the 1st of, of uh, January over there on the hill where the first settlers came into uh, the, the, this area, the Bunkerville and Mesquite area, and built the first little building on that hill, and it's just right over the river. You can see it. There's a, pa a flagpole, and uh, would would like to kind of spruce that up, make a little better display area, and would like to help in some restoration in Bunkerville too. They they have some awesome buildings over there that are still there. So unlike Mesquite, whose houses seem to have been just kind of a little more humble, or usually what it is, it's more in the way of progress, and so they have a tendency to go. Um, get get raised, but um, so that is that is kind of our soapbox right now. We are wanting people's support and efforts when we have projects and when, when we get things going and get permission. We really appreciate the city and their forward thinking in purchasing the three properties uh, that or, or having the three properties that we really uh, are interested in here in Mesquite and want to be involved in. I was incorrectly understood or, or misquoted in one of the paper articles that said the old, uh, one of the buildings, I think it said the Relief Side building was going to be our headquarters. Well, it's not. <laughs> and, and we don't really intend for it to do it. And, and it can't be. It's not ours. It, it's, it's ours. It belongs to the city. And so we really don't need a headquarters. The headquarters is wherever we meet, which has been in our homes. And... Uh, but we have dreams of having places that people can go, that we can take school children to, and show them life of early mesquite. Very humble, basic dwellings. It, it's actually three perfect examples. The Little Rock House is where a family lived. It was built in 1880, one of the oldest structures in Southern Nevada. The other one is the Relief Society building, which testifies of the industriousness of the women. The women who built that building did it by themselves. They insisted that they do it by themselves. They planted, harvested, and shipped to the cotton mill a crops of cotton here in the valley. And from those monies, they built that building. And that is across the street. That is also on Willow. And the old gymnasium, many of us went to school there, went to church there. It was the gathering place. It was an important building in town. And uh, that's, that's a three project in Mesquite that we, that we really would like to be involved in. But there are others. We, we do things uh, just to preserve history, to, to give people an opportunity to... Um, to know what life was like and how we are as a community. And we still feel it. When I get together with, with our society, a lot of them are people that I've grown up with or people that I've known all my life. There is a real feeling we all feel the same. We're very proud of our, of our ancestors. We're, we're proud of Mesquite. We're proud of what Mesquite has come, become. It is, it is a wonderful town, unique in a lot of ways. The history is fascinating. I find it absolutely fascinating. And um, uh, we've, we've got a story to tell. And, and I hope that the book has helped a little bit. No, it's been a very good. Um, I, I was just going to add on that our history, Mesquite's history, is a lot of history that people moving here have lived through in other areas. 
so it's a comparison and just important to to remember that whole it thing is, and, yeah. and and see what they went through here versus there and grow from it and learn yeah. from it yeah any other thoughts final thoughts on your book or i just would would just like to um no i can't think at home i thought of all kinds of wonderful things you know though i to tell you uh, about that I thought, okay, the book is done, I've got everything is said, and then my mother passes away before she even has a chance. But I had a chance to tell her that I had dedicated the book to her, but she passed away before the book actually came out. But I was going through my mother's things. Now I thought my mother had shown me everything. I thought she had shared, because I had said, okay, mom, now is your chance. If you've got any photographs or anything that you have that you'd like to... Share it. Well, I, maybe she had forgotten about these. In the bottom of her um, little, she called it little cedar chest. It was when uh, Lane's cedar chest made little tiny. It's a funny little chest. I found two newspaper clippings. And one was about, and, and it was, I've shared them with the museum because they, they were kind of, they filled some holes that we, one was about the CCC boys. Now, we had, the file is very slim at the museum because we honestly cannot find too much about the boys that served here. We know some were from Ohio, but we also know with the CC that they were coming and going, and they, were, they served from all over. But this is a story, and my mother saved it because it was about my father. My father, among many things, with the water, the power, he worked blind. He also ran the projector at the movie th house in town, the, the, the show house in town. That was the L word. And he ran the projector up in this terrible little s sweaty cage up there. And it tells about in the 40s, um, no, it had to have been the 30s with the, with the CCC boys, a fire started. Now, you know, old, old movie film, celluloid, just like that. Well, a fire started. And uh, my dad uh, got burned a little bit. But in the theater, in, in the audience, were all the CC boys. They had CCC boys. They had come over to go to the movie. So I don't know. Somehow their, their uh, training just kicked right in, and they got everybody ushered out. It says that... Uh, th there was a serious panic was averted as the projection room caught fire in the middle of a show. Oh, I, they don't mention the movie. I'd like to know if it was a, you know, Tom Mix movie or what it was. But it was packed. Uh, the house was packed. And uh, as soon as the fire was discovered, the CCC boys, trained to meet just such an emergency, took the situation in hand, calmed the patrons, and marched them in order, and then formed a bucket brigade to battle the flame. So you can find stuff everywhere. I mean, I, I would like to think. I'm not saying there's another book in me, <laughs> and I'm not saying that we could, but we, if, if, if all of us could, could find things that we could help expand our, our history here, uh, that information. And on a personal note, I also found, which my mother never talked to me about, when I was a year and a half, I had an accident in my home. I, I was a toddler, and I fell down stairs onto a cement floor with my baby bottle. Uh, the bottle broke and cut me very se severely about the face and the eye. And uh, my, gra my grandfather, John Lewis Pulsifer, drove, because we had no medical help here, drove to Dr. A.W. McGregor in St. George. He looked at me and said, you know, there's just really not much I can do. You need to get to Salt Lake. There were no planes available. So he drove uh, 365 miles from St. George to Salt Lake in three hours and 58 minutes. Uh, he set the fast time. He had, my grandpa always had a brand new car. So he had, a, he had a fast car. He had my mom in the back holding me, and probably that was so traumatic she never mentioned it in her life very much about it. So uh, I, I'm kind of free to talk about it now since I know that she will not be re-traumatized by all of this. So she was holding me. They drove, you know, unbelievably. My father did tell me as they got to Parowan, Utah, there was a herd of sheep on the road. And now that was common. You know, old Highway 91, there was a herd of sheep. Well, my dad was an old sheep herder. He got out, 
and whistled and said, okay, okay, dad, meaning his father-in-law, my grandfather, keep the car right to my back and I'll, and he just was able to part those sheep all the way uh, through, through that herd. And um, they got one stretch of road from Beaver to Fillmore, a distance of 63 miles, was negotiated in 39 minutes, a speed of 95 miles an hour. He pat, this is a quote, he passed through many of the small Utah towns well above 80 miles an hour with police officers cooperating, clearing the way. At Provo, a traffic officer halted him and he, uh, and he was, anyway, they asked him to lead them through to Salt Lake and, and he said, well, will you take the child and put it in your car and with the siren you could get to the hospital faster. He said, I don't think I can do any faster than what you're doing. You go ahead, I'll radio ahead. And so anyway, they got there. An old, really old newspaper clipping. So I'm keeping digging, all of you keep digging too. So anyway, <laughs> that's the story. I don't think I'll write another book. Uh, deadlines were, 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 just, were just really hard. <laughs> okay, did you want to ask? Or yes, but questions? anyone, have, have I not answered every question in the world? Any questions <laughs> out there? Yes. Oh, there is a question. And married? Okay. So... Yeah, so, so you're asking how many CCC boys married local girls. I know of one, uh, was it, oh, three, okay, two or three in Bunkerville. Yeah, I can't think of any here in Mesquite. I didn't find any, but I, I knew there was in Bunkerville. Darlene? Lucina Levitt, Shaner, married. Oh, the Sh that's right, the Shaner. Okay, so there was. Yes, well, hey, you know, all these new young men come into town. I, you betcha. <laughs> I've, I've known, I, in St. George, I knew one fairly well-known case, and that was Frank Holland, uh, who married Alice Bentley, and uh, they're the parents of uh, Jeffrey R. Holland, and he was a CCC boy in St. George. So that, you know, I, I don't know a lot of cases, but I'm sure that was really exciting for the girls. <laughs> and probably not a lot of fun for the guys. Yeah, Gary? My, my grandfather was a foreman. Uh, you know, and that's another thing. It, it Money-wise, I mean, for these jobs to come in, but he was a, he was a CCC foreman, and he, uh, he helped with a lead a group, yeah, to do work. St Yes, they, uh, yeah, they, they built, yeah, and so when that terrible flood came at the end and the CCC boys were moving out, my grandfather used what influence he had and got them back here to help, I mean, or we just, it would have been a real mess, but we can still see evidence today of some of the work that CCC boys did, Diver um, dams up in washes up, up along the, uh, the slope here, there's, there's still places of, uh, that you can see. That's, okay, that was CCC boys, yeah. That, that helped. I mean, they did a lot of things that, uh, and they, they, worked on, they worked on the dams and they were available. It was a, a life-saving project for a lot of places in the country. Okay, I can see a hand back here first. Is, do I see a hand? Oh, no, I'm, it's a reflection of Gary's hand. <laughs> yes, I thought that was you, Randy, okay. Okay, no. <laughs> yeah, I... R repeat the question. Yes. I, I do not know the count. But I'll tell you, I saw a lot of cases. Not only did families lose small children in irrigation ditches, they lost them in fires 
children who would fall into open fires, and another one was children who were kicked by horses, and another one was run over by wagons. Those, it was just, it was really sad. It was, it was tragic, but yeah, and, and no help, no help to go to. It was, yes, very sad. All right, any, any other questions? Well, you've just been a wonderful audience. Thank you, Geraldine. You, you were wonderful. Thank you.